Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this video, we're going to be discussing metaplasia. This is a very important concept that you should keep in the back of your mind. And these basic uh, understanding of this mechanism is very important. Now, if you haven't already done so, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel because we're going to be posting brand new content every single day for your education for free. So if you guys really like these videos, please support us by just subscribing to the channel because that really helps us out. So with that being said, let's discuss cellular adaptations before we actually talk about metaplasia in detail because you need to have a better understanding of the basics about this concept, right? So the main things you need to remember, first and foremost, is that at the molecular level, our cells are constantly under a lot of stress because of the environment that they're that they're faced uh, with the the issues that they're dealing with you know day to day they have feelings okay but when it comes to our cells essentially you need to remember that the environment that they're in is very harsh for the most part right and one example of this is going to be our stomach lining our stomach lining is constantly being exposed to what hydrochloric acid that's a very acidic uh, acidic fluid, right? And that acid has the ability to corrode away our epithelial lining of the stomach. So what has our body done? It's developed ad adaptations for our cells to be able to survive. And there are many adaptations that occur. Uh, but that's at the, uh, the cellular level. When you're talking at the at the macro level, when you're talking about organs, you have to remember that unlike the molecular, the cellular level, our organs are constantly under a state of homeostasis for the most part. You see, when they're exposed to a certain type of stress, they're able to adapt and they're able to come up with these types of cellular adaptations. They're able to use these cellular adaptations to handle that stress so that they can continue their function. And the change that happens in our organs is usually based off of the type and the severity of the stress that's being placed upon our organ and now eventually an increase in stress a increase in the normal amount of stress that our body can handle will initially lead to the growth of an organ that is very important to remember because the stress is unlike the normal day-to-day -day stress our body is placed under our our organs are going to adapt and the one of the ways they adapt is by growing in size to handle that stress so there are two main types of growth adaptations you need to be aware of those are hypertrophy and hyperplasia. Hypertrophy deals with the increase in the size of our cells and hyperplasia deals with the increase in the number of cells, okay? And both of these we have discussed in detail in previous lectures. Both of these are very important. These are high yield AF. So you should definitely watch those videos on our account. Now, when it comes to growth adaptations, once the stressor is removed, our body, like I said, is going to reduce uh, our cell size, our organ size, because like I said right here, excuse me, right, right I said right here, our organs are generally under a state of homeostasis. So to maintain homeostasis, stasis you have to undo these growth mechanisms and the way we undo that growth mechanism or those growth adaptations is through atrophy atrophy is what allows our organs to maintain homeostasis essentially okay so keep that in the back of your mind we've also made a video about atrophy so you can go check that out uh, on our account so that's essentially what's going on. But what happens if the stress is too much of the stress is being placed upon the, uh, the organ and uh, the organ decides to change? Well, that is what we call metaplasia. Organs can also adapt other than just the growth adaptations. They can also adapt by changing the type of cells that are made up of uh, in that organ. So let's talk about metaplasia. Metaplasia is the mechanism where you have the transformation of one type of differentiated cell type to another differentiated cell type. And that's very important because metaplasia is another cellular adaptation that allows us to maintain proper function in our body so that our body doesn't get overly uh, stressed out and get damaged. Now, this change occurs because of the change in stress of an organ that leads essentially to this type of cell uh, happening, being formed from one from another cell. OK, this concept, this concept is very, very important. This is a very high yield concept because metaplasia is going to come back in many different conditions, disease states, and it plays an important role when we're talking about uh, cancer and dysplasia and carcinomas being developed. OK, so you need to remember this concept really well. Now, how does this all happen? Essentially, this occurs via cellular reprogramming at a stem cell level. 
That is very important. Of all things that you can remember, do not forget that metaplasia is happening at the system cell level. Okay, this is very, very important. So I'm putting a bold high yield AF on this. So you do not forget this. Do you remember what other mechanism in terms of growth adaptation also occurred at the stem cell level? Well, if you guess hyperplasia, you were right because hyperplasia is an increase in the number of cells. So in order to increase the number of cells, you have to activate the stem cells to produce more cells. And this is a very good question that you could be asked. You could be asked what mechanism, what cellular adaptation is similar to the adaptation that occurs in metaplasia or what is the uh, underlying mechanism of this condition uh, or this cellular adaptation and what resembles this cellular adaptation? And the answer would be either metaplasia or uh, um, hyperplasia, okay? So keep that in mind because you're dealing with stem cell activation and cellular reprogramming at the stem cell level. So what happens in metaplasia? Well, most commonly, metaplasia is gonna occur at the surface epithelium. And this is because this is the most common site of the environmental changes that our body is being uh, faced with, right? So for example, if you're talking about the stomach lining, that occurs at the uh, at the most superficial level, at the surface of our stomach lining. And the reason why is that's the environmental impact that's being happening, uh, that, that's being affect, that's affecting our body, excuse me, at that moment. So usually this is a condition or this is a, a, a cellular adaptation that occurs at the surface epithelium. Very rarely is it going to be deeper than that. And the reason why all this happens is because these metaplastic cells are going to be better adapted to handle the stress that's being placed upon them. So to better explain this, let's talk about a disease condition, a, a, a pathologic state called Barrett's esophagus. And this is going to be pretty important. This is definitely going to be talked about in many different uh, uh, discussions, whether we're talking about the GI system, whether we're talking about cancer. But you need to remember Barrett's esophagus because this is a classic, classic pathologic state that you need to know about, okay? So Barrett's esophagus is the abnormal change that occurs in the mucosal lining in the lower portion of the esophagus, okay? The lower portion. Essentially, in Barrett's esophagus, you are going to have a metaplastic change that's happening, okay? Now, when we're talking about the lower portion, and I'm gonna draw it right here. Let's say this is your nose, this is your mouth, this is your chin, Okay, and then you have your esophagus going down all the way into your stomach. Okay, so this is the part you need to remember, the lower part. So this portion and essentially your, your esophagus, the normal lining of our esophagus, the epithelial lining, is actually stratified squamous epithelium. That is stratified squamous. In Barrett's esophagus, however, because you have a metaplastic change happening, our epithelial lining of the esophagus is going to change from stratified squamous, okay, to simple columnar epithelium with interspersed goblet cells. Very, very important, very high yield. In this slide, you have to remember these two points because this is a very easy question to get wrong. And it's a very easy give me question in terms of tests. You could easily be asked, what is the conversion that occurs in Barrett's esophagus? And the answer would be from stratified squamous epithelium to simple columnar epithelium and with or without interspersed goblet cells. Sometimes they don't write that in the answer options. Now, usually you have to remember that this type of cellular uh, cell type, the simple columnar, is only present in the small and large intestines. Now I'm going to make you guys think, why would that be? Why would it be that in the esophagus, you have a, a, a simple or stratified squamous epithelium and lower down your GI tract past your stomach, you're going to have simple columnar, especially in the small and large intestines. Well, the answer is what is in the stomach hydrochloric acid. And hydrochloric acid, like I said, is a very acidic environment. It's going to be very corrosive. So our intestines, our small and large intestines, essentially have developed a mechanism to be able to adapt 
to the hydrochloric acid when our stomach empties its contents into our, our duodenum, our uh, jejunum, and our ileum and into our large intestine, right, into our colon, etc., etc. And the way we have done that is through many mechanisms, but one of the mechanisms is because of simple columnar epithelium that's able to secrete other types of substances to be able to counteract that acidic environment and better protect the the uh, um, the the, line, the the epithelial lining of our intestines. So why then would you get the metaplastic change in the esophagus right here from simple from stratified squamous, which by the way will look something like this, right? These are very thin and tiny um, stratified flat cells. Stratified just means they're in layers like this. Okay, and I'll show you guys a photo in a second. Okay, so from stratified squamous epithelium to simple columnar with some goblet cells. Okay, why would you see this? Well, the simple answer goes back to our stomach. Essentially, again, it is the hydrochloric acid. And the reason why is that hydrochloric acid is being refluxed upwards into the esophagus and that acidic content is causing a change to occur in the epithelial lining of the esophagus. So Barrett's esophagus is going to occur due to constant GERD, gastro, gastroesophageal reflux disease, where you have the acidic environment, the hydrochloric stomach acid being uh, uh, reflux into the esophagus, something our esophagus is actually not really prepared for because physiologically, our stomach acid goes downwards right into our small and large intestines, okay? So the columnar cells, like I said earlier, are going to be better suited to handle the acidic environment. And when all of this happens, if left untreated, the reason why Barrett's esophagus is so dangerous is that it can progress to esophageal carcinoma. Do not forget this. Barrett's esophagus is a type of dysplastic lesion that can progress to carcinoma. So metaplasia, if left untreated, can, and you need to remember this, it can progress into a pathologic carcinoma or a cancerous state that can be very deadly. So let's look at what Barrett's esophagus looks like in the histology. As you can see right here, you can see the change occurring. You see these right here, these are your stratified squamous epithelium. You can see the stratification because the, the uh, squamous epithelium is layered on top of each other. That's why it's stratified. And the squamous epithelium, you can see by these little tiny cells that look like this, right? And they're in layers. So once you cross this junction, however, if you look carefully, you can kind of see that these are now more cuboidal and columnar like cells, okay, with some goblet cells right here and 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 right here. So they're interspersed. And the goblet cell is going to uh, secrete a lot of secretions for our esophagus so that our esophagus is able to handle the acidic environment. That is very important. This is what Barrett's esophagus looks like. Commit this photo, this metaplastic change to your mind because you will very easily be tested on this, okay? So that's Barrett's esophagus. That's one simple example of metaplasia that you should have in the back of your mind. So when it comes to metaplasia, one thing you always need to remember is metaplasia is actually a precursor lesion. And the and the, I guess a good thing, the, the way I think about it, the good thing about metaplasia is that it's reversible if you just remove the stressor. So for example, if you remove the stressor that's being placed on the esophagus, i.e. the stomach acid being reflux, the Barrett's esophagus change, the metaplastic change that occurs will go away and it will be uh, back to normal. But if left untreated, it can progress to dysplasia and cancer. And that's what I wrote right here, right? Barrett's esophagus, if left untreated, can uh, progress to esophageal adenocarcinoma or esophageal carcinoma, okay? But if you treat it, Barrett's esophagus will resolve. That's why we treat Barrett's esophagus. That's why we treat GERD uh, pretty uh, aggressively so that we don't get these types of dangerous conditions to occur, okay? Now, one thing to remember is apocrine metaplasia. Apocrine metaplasia is not going to lead to cancer because reversible transformation of cells are occurring uh, in, in apocrine metaplasia because this is a type of metaplasia where you have reversible transformation of cells 
to an apocrine phenotype. And the common example would be fibrocystic changes in our breast, right? Of course, this is a metaplastic change because the, the type of cell is actually changing into an apocrine type of cell, an apocrine phenotype, but there is no association with this type of change leading to cancer. Very, very important. So when you have fibrocystic changes in the breast due to trauma uh, or when you have fibroadenoma, a lot of times those are very benign conditions. You're not going to see a, uh, any sort of cancerous lesion usually arising from that condition. So they're considered to be safe metaplastic changes. Okay, So you don't have to really reverse them. And sometimes it might not be possible to reverse these states. Okay, And this is very common in the breast, like I said. So fibrocystic changes in the breast, very common, occurs in a lot of people. You're going to see this at least a couple times while you practice. And especially in medical school, you're going to see this a lot. Now, one thing to remember when it comes to metaplasia, and this is a pretty high yield concept, this is going to come a lot in biochemistry and in other topics and other subjects as well, is vitamin A. Vitamin A is very important because a vitamin A deficiency will lead to metaplasia occurring. Okay, keep this in the back of your mind as we continue these lectures, but I'm going to mention it right now so you do not forget that metaplasia and vitamin A are very closely linked together. Why is that the case? Well, vitamin A is a very important, uh, a very, very important fat soluble vitamin. And it's really important because it is necessary for maintenance of very specialized tissue. For example, our eye conjunctiva. Our eye conjunctiva actually needs vitamin A. And if you don't have enough vitamin A, you're gonna develop other types of changes like keratomalacia. Keratomalacia is a type of metaplastic change that occurs in the conjunctiva of our eye because vitamin A we don't have enough vitamin A, we have a vitamin A deficiency. And this is what cratomalacia looks like. You can see this milky substance in the conjunctiva that really shouldn't be there, okay? So that is one example of metaplasia that can be very pathological that you need to remember. Another thing you need to remember about metaplasia is that mesenchymal tissue can also lead to metaplasia. And the classic case of mesenchymal tissue metaplasia is myositis ossificans. Myositis ossificans, again, a very high yield topic, very easy subject, very simple in my opinion, that you just need to remember a few things about. Number one, myositis ossificans is seen right here. You see this? This is the mesenchymal or connective tissue that has changed from mesenchymal or aka connective tissue, right? Just collagen and other types of fibrous tissue to now a skeletal uh, bone uh, tissue, right? You see how this is actually calcified tissue. And the reason why this happens is because of trauma to skeletal muscle. Our actual muscle cells are going to undergo trauma. This leads to inflammation of the skeletal muscles during the healing process, which is really unavoidable. And when this inflammation occurs, we're going to see a lot of metaplastic changes occur, including production of bone in the skeletal muscle. Now, this is very important, okay? This is going to look very similar to osteosarcoma, which is a, 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 a type of bone cancer. But... The key difference is that this type of uh, this type of metaplastic change does not come off of the bone. And I know you can't see it because I drew it, but there is an actual little uh, space between the bone. If you look carefully, you can see that there is a space and this is not connected. Look over here. You can see the space right here and right here and right here. Okay, when you're talking about osteosarcoma, you'll probably see a bone right in the x-ray and coming off of it will be this type of bony uh, met. Uh, or a bony uh, uh, structure that's connected to the bone that will tell you that this is osteosarcoma. So when you have a bone being produced uh, not connected to the actual bones in our hand or in the skeletal, uh, uh, near any skeletal bones, you should think about metaplasia, especially myositis ossificans, in the setting of recent trauma or injury to the stomach muscle. Okay, so that is metaplasia in a nutshell. This is a very important topic you need to know, and it can get very easy, uh, very confusing. Wow, excuse me. This can get very confusing very easily. Okay, like I said, uh, just saying that was pretty confusing for me. So make sure you understand the concept of metaplasia really well. Make sure you're able to draw conclusions and connections between metaplasia as a cellular adaptation to hyperplasia as a growth adaptation. And the answer, remember, is going to be that they both involve uh, stem cells. Okay, make sure you understand what Barrett's esophagus is and why 
why it is so dangerous and why we treat it so aggressively. You should definitely understand the, the, the pathology and pathophysiology behind Barrett's esophagus, along with other types of pathologic conditions that involve metaplasia. For example, uh, uh, apocrine metaplasia, like in the breast, which is usually benign, right? So fibrocystic changes. You should definitely understand the concept of vitamin A, how it can lead to metaplasia because vitamin A is necessary for our specialized tissues, especially our epithelial tissues. And in terms of uh, uh, myositis ossificans, you should understand that metaplasia is the main mechanism that's going on in myositis ossificans. So if you understand all that, you're going to do really well in terms of your understanding of metaplasia. I hope this was helpful. I hope you enjoyed this topic. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel because we're going to be posting brand new content every single day. Thank you again for your support and I'll see you back here in the next episode or the next lecture. See you soon.